the solar system planet Earth, North America, the United States of America. My name is Brian Engelman, and if you're here because you normally check out our Agree to Disagree show, where we discuss the current events in the world, uh, this is not one of those shows. So if you would kindly see yourself out, go ahead. Um, I would understand. I would prefer if you stay, because I'm going to do a sports show. It may not be your cup of tea, but it is for me. So I have the Unhappy Hour Sports Show. And then, of course, I have the Agree to Disagree Show. Follow us on all of the places for all of the things. We don't always just cover my favorite teams. However, there is an episode of what we do here that is called Strictly Browns, where we discuss the Cleveland Browns. This is... Uh, we're going to talk about Deshaun Watson. Did he just play his best game as a Cleveland Brown? Perhaps, maybe. Uh, we're talking about Miles Garrett and his dominant performance. Everything that's going on is just clicking on all cylinders. Miles Garrett, phew, huh, looking like a man possessed out there in a good way. So, of course, the Cleveland Browns, did what they needed to do. And what is that? I think, unfortunately, you, you saw Coach Ryan Day with the Ohio State Buckeyes. It came down to the literally the final play, um, like a one-yard touchdown run off to the left. No time remaining. That was like the one play. We're going to try to get a couple of inches and score a touchdown, and it's over. And the Buckeyes avoided, narrowly avoided, a bit of a – disaster a calamity it would have been difficult um you know it, it, it's a tough game anytime you're playing another top 10 team as a top 10 team that is challenging um playing it in notre dame in a hostile environment that is challenging especially with a first year quarterback um you know but ryan day afterwards he the buckeyes got the win uh, and he, Ryan Day said it, it, it's, it's Ohio versus the world. And it just, it, it, that's something that has taken off over the past 10 years, but maybe it's always felt that way. Um, it is Ohio against the world. And when we're looking at the Cleveland Browns, it's Cleveland versus the referees too. Let's. Let's not forget, um, th this has been a snake-bitten franchise since our return in 1999, I believe. Um, just, it seems like the referees have it in for us. There was a play that is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. It was a pass to Amari Cooper that he caught, clearly caught. Nice throw, nice catch. He took off running and then stopped and turned around and then the defender stopped and turned around and he just kept running and went for a touchdown. It's a clear touchdown. They said that the referee blew his whistle too quickly. Why is the referee blowing the whistle anyway? He's ruling that he stepped out of bounds. Why not? Review that. Why would you call that if you're not 100% certain? Even if you are 100% certain, why? I've never seen anything like it. I saw Deshaun Watson last week get two roughing, what was it, uh, personal foul? Were they personal fouls? For face masking other opponents. Meanwhile, he got his face mask grabbed and spun 180 degrees off to the side. No, no penalty flag there. Now, I guess any franchise could probably say, oh, the refs screwed us. You know, it's 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 not even direct competition. There's too much Vegas influence. The referees, it's an entertainment league. It's not even direct competition, gambling. So it, it, it kind of skirts legalities. I don't know how I feel about that. I feel like when, when these gaming apps are gaining traction across the country. I mean, you want to talk about real RICO investigations? If 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 they're fixing the games, 
This is a massive money laundering operation. This is Rico. This is real Rico. You've seen Rico in the news. This ain't Rico Suave. <laughs> are there any other famous Rico? Uncle Rico? That was one too. Who are any other famous Ricos? Uh, Rico Suave. Rico. I, I got nothing. Nothing else, I don't think. But th there are a lot of people chattering about the leagues being rigged and leave your comments by the way leave your hearts tap the likes the hearts i don't know if you're watching us on twitter or on youtube what have you but thank you for being here but if you can leave your comments i will try to incorporate some of them into the show um i don't know sometimes i can see them and sometimes i cannot but i will try um but yeah, I, I I get the 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 distinct feeling that the NFL owners have not been very happy with the Cleveland Browns. First off, they feel you know they they are the elite, they are the deep state, they are the the one percent, they are the new world order, they they are the one percent, the the owners, the top of the food chain in the sports world, and they feel as though they're better than you. And you know what? If they want to take their team to another city. That's their prerogative, not yours. You know, and I think Green Bay gets this right. Green Bay, the city of Green Bay owns the team. Let me let me see if I can. Get you. The Packers have been a publicly owned nonprofit corporation since August 18, 1923. Oh, that's a hundred years. Just a, been a hundred years. Okay. The corporation currently has approximately 537,460 stockholders who collectively own approximately 5,200,000 shares of stock following the sixth stock sale in 2000 in 21. So instead of having an owner or a small group of owners, they're owned by thousands of fans, 360,000 shareholders to be exact. Now, I think every city should be publicly owned. This is, this is I don't know, this, this may, I may depart from my libertarian leanings uh, very, let's just say, uh, leery suspicious if you will of centralized planning of big government of that type of thing but i think i think in sports the city should own the team i really do i think i think green bay packers get it right it, it, these are public private partnerships to redevelop areas of of a downtown cityscape and you bring in all the tourism, all of the Uber and Lyft, the restaurants, the groceries, the bars, the, the, the hotels, the airlines, the merchandise, shopping. Then you have the extra couple days if you come out and do a couple days and go to a new it's a It's a great attraction for the city. And so... The Cleveland Browns were taken away by Art Modell in 1996, taken over to Baltimore because Indianapolis stole Baltimore's team, so they had to steal ours. It sucks. It's the worst. Injuries are the worst part of sports. A very close second is the fact that ownership can steal your favorite team away. It it should it's it's terrible. But Cleveland did something different when this when the city was taken. And I think the NFL, they, they've never really gotten over it. They look down their nose. They are the, up the powerful with their cigars and their backlit room. You know, they're, they're, they're dimly lit rooms in the back. Plotting, <laughs> stroking goatees. I don't think the owners were thrilled because the Browns went to court and said, you don't have a right to take our team. We own the, the team name we we have a right to the colors and the team and the history if you want to take these players in this organization i guess you're going to take them but you're leaving your team colors, and so the ravens became a brand new franchise sometimes that happens sometimes that doesn't the raiders are still the raiders but the houston oilers 
are the Tennessee Titans. And then Houston gets another team, but they don't go back to the Oilers. They say they're the Texans. I don't know. The Cleveland Ohioans doesn't really sound right to me. If I'm missing some particular component of the Texans history that I'm supposed to be aware of, which I'm not, it, fill me in in the comments. But it, it seemed that the league was annoyed that Cleveland took a little bit too much power from their private little group and that they've had it in for us ever since. And they said, fine, well, you know, and that was the other thing. It was like, we want to keep our team name and our colors, and we want an expansion team. We want our team back. How dare you? Why don't you just give Baltimore an expansion team? What are you doing? They didn't like being called out, and they didn't like losing. They, they did not appreciate that they lost. Well, they lost that battle. And so the Cleveland Browns were rebirthed a few years later. And it just seems like the, the refereeing has been exponentially worse against Cleveland ever since. Like this is an ancient grudge that, that carries on to this day. And we don't even particularly know why. However, the grudge remains. And so there's a thought that, that the Cleveland Browns kind of have this snake bitten reboot and that the league will never let us succeed. Well, I don't, I don't buy into that stuff per se. I mean, I do to a certain degree, but I don't think it's insurmountable. What I do think is that we're going to have to win every game by at least 22 points. Maybe my math's off. Let's say if we go uh, eight points with a two-point conversion. So three touchdowns. Let me, let me just, what am I, eight, 16, 24. Three touchdowns and three two-point conversions. We're going to have to win every game by 25 points. That's it. I'm not taking chances. Do the math here. 27 to 3, the Cleveland Browns won. It was a little too close for me. A little too close. But this game was never really in doubt. <laughs> this game was something special. You held the opposing quarterback to 104 yards. 104 yards, no touchdowns, no interceptions, 13 to 25. You held Derrick Henry, one of the best backs in the NFL, 20 yards on 11 carries. This defense. It was something impressive, something real impressive. The, the most valuable player of the, of the game is the Cleveland Browns defense. They have shown up now two out of the three games. And in the middle game, you know, half the points that got put on the board was the offense fumbling the ball away, which is something Deshaun Watson almost did, by the way. I don't know what that behind the back pass was supposed to be, but it was very ill-advised. Now, if, if we flip it over, this, this was a pass-heavy uh, Brown's performance. They gave five carries to Kareem Hunt for 13 yards, average of 2.6, not something you write home about. Jerome Ford did even worse. 10 carries for only 18 yards. Uh, that's a 1.8 yard average, but he did get a touchdown. Pierre Strong Jr. had the highest average of four and a half yards. That was six carries for 27 yards. Pierre Strong Jr. coming over from the uh, New England Patriots, we traded Wheatley, an offensive lineman. Um, so it's not like the it's not like the ground game was doing that well. And that is a cause of concern for the Cleveland Browns with Nick Chubb. It was pretty obvious that that was going to be one of the strengths of the team to lean on. Obviously, we went out and signed Deshaun Watson to a mega deal with mega expectations. But it was a, a Nick Chubb ground and pound. I mean, Nick Chubb has, what, the third highest yards per carry since he got in the league? or I forget exactly what the stat is, but he's among the, the greats to ever play the game. So we went from maybe a run first team. And I look, they gave Elijah Moore three carries. They gave Marquise Goodwin a carry. 
I am curious about the Harrison Bryant stuff. Why is he the short yardage guy? And if he's the short yardage QB sneak guy, doesn't that really give it away when you're going to do the QB sneak? I suppose if you're going to do the QB sneak and then you show people what it is, they're going to see it. They're going to call it out. They're going to say it's a sneak, sneak, sneak. But you've actually called the mirror image play where it doesn't touch his hand at all and you misdirect it somewhere else. Like I get that there's chess and then there's counter chess. But I'm curious if anyone could help me understand the Harrison Bryant getting two carries. Deshaun Watson had four carries for 16 yards. So it really turned into a, a um, carry by committee situation. Uh, Spears only had four carries for six yards for Tennessee yesterday. They only had two running backs touch the ball. We had two, four, six, seven people running the ball for the Cleveland Browns. But this really was a game about consistency. Uh, the Browns in the first period put up three points. Then in the second period, they put up 10 points. Then seven, then seven, total of 27. Over the course of a game, that adds up. Deshaun Watson played his best game in the Cleveland Browns uniform. I'm going to give him credit. I guess I probably can't give him credit for a, the Amari Cooper touchdown. Because half of it was weird when they blew the whistle and then the defender stopped. So I don't know that that would have been, it would have been a sideline completion. Would it have gone for a touchdown? I don't know that I could quite give him a third touchdown. I, I want to give him the edge on that, but just say he was 28 of 33. That would have probably put him over 300 yards, two touchdowns in the air. A rating of 123.4. That's double the rating of Ryan Tannehill's 62.8. More than double. Almost double. Exactly double? Almost exactly double. But yeah, Deshaun Watson made it happen. Deshaun Watson is looking like the back that we paid all this money for. The quarterback that we've needed. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with finally seeing some improvement out of this guy. It's been two years. I know last year he came in rusty, but did he? Like, how did you not have the playbook all off season? I know you couldn't practice with the team, but why weren't you? Why didn't you have a, like a, you're telling me with your 230 million, you didn't have a trainer that was going through the playbook and you were just spending eight hours a day, figuring things out and just doing something. Maybe he was just sitting around playing video games. I don't know. But when he came in last year, he did not look impressive. <clears throat> a lot of shoestring, short arm in it. Then this year, a lot of it kind of air mailing it. Throwing a lot of these sideline passes, you know, eight yards out of bounds. Like you're not even giving your, you're not even remotely giving your guy a shot. You know, first game of the year with inclement weather conditions against the Bengals. Yes, you let a few go over sail over Marquise. Um, Goodwin, but I finally saw efficient quarterback play, uh, you know, the third down conversions, this was improvement and we need it, but this, this really is the floor of what we should accept for Deshaun Watson. He was paid like the top dog. He's got to play like top three, top four. I really don't even want to say top five. He was paid the best. People are enamored with his skill set. Multi Pro Bowl player. Good. Well, look, we're not going to be able to be that running game, that running game, be that running team like we used to without Nick Chubb. You don't lose perhaps the best in the NFL and just expect to seamlessly put somebody else in and have the same incredible results. We're going to try. We're going to do the best that we can. I am concerned about our left tackle position. I am worried that Deshaun Watson is going to get blindsided because Jedrick Wills is just not quite consistent enough to, to handle that side. Uh, I'm curious to see how everybody grades out. Did, did they? When do the gradings come out? What's up, Justin? How are you, sir? I don't know. Can I invite you into this? 
I guess probably not because I'm doing a restream. But if you can, Justin, type any comments or questions. What questions do you have? What what impressed you about the game? Um, what concerns do you have about the Browns moving forward? Two-part question. What impressed you? And what are you most um, concerned with? What up, Sal? How are you, sir? Uh, congratulations, Sal. I saw you in a cap and gown, by the way. I don't know what that was, but it looks like you achieved something. Bravo. Um, Amari Cooper, they fed the ball to him. Seven receptions, 116 yards. He is the number one on this team. Got his one touchdown, could have been two. But, I mean, they spread the ball around. Nine targets for Elijah Moore. He had nine receptions. Nine for nine. He was kind of a security blanket. Kareem Hunt had two catches on three targets. And Joku, four targets, four receptions. It was a very efficient day. DPJ, Donovan Peoples-Jones, three receptions on four targets. Jerome Ford, two receptions on three targets and a touchdown. The ball moved around. And that's what you're going to need. You can't always play a football game like it's like you're a fifth grader playing Madden. You know, before you know the playbooks better, it, a lot of it's like, I'm just going to chuck it up. I'm going to, I'm going to run back 10 yards. I'm just going to launch it on a hail Mary. And hopefully I catch a 70 yard bomb. That's not like great football strategy. <laughs> kind of need to do the Tom Brady thing. You take what's given. And if they're taking certain components away, you go with what's left, your best opportunity. And you're going to have to air it up. You're going to have to go deep because you got to keep the defense honest. If you don't show them different things, the defense is just going to hone in on one area for you. And so I liked that Stefanski, Coach Stefanski, I think he called a good game, a really good game. We've, we've given him a lot of credit. I'm sorry, a lot of grief. What's the opposite of credit? <laughs> Debit? We've given Stefanski, Coach Stefanski, I call him by his proper name, only when I'm, when I'm happy with his choices. Otherwise, he's Kev. But I liked that you had some reverses. I said that the whole game with the Steelers. They were pinning their ears back and just blitzing us. They were going bonkers because they they weren't worried about getting put out of position on a play that went behind them. That's exactly what you do with bubble screens. It's exactly what you do, slip screens, any sort of screen that's kind of like behind the line of scrimmage where you can over pursue and you're like, yes, I got the quarterback. And you go, oh, crap, there's a reason I got completely through. It's because the blockers are behind me. And there goes the screen pass. And now there they go down the sidelines, 45 yards for a touchdown because I over pursued. That's how you catch them sleeping. That's how you keep them honest. A lot of a quarter, a lot of an offensive line's success will depend on the ability of the quarterback to make a quick, smart decision and get the damn ball out of their hands. I did not see Deshaun Watson doing that um automatically or instinctively i still saw him holding the ball too long i still saw him you know uh, sl kind of running around back there he took three sacks for 26 yards but just the quickness of, of getting the ball moving take the three yard gain get it out of your hand don't don't take the sack so the offensive line situation is always a little i don't know they kind of get too much credit and get too much blame i think the same happens with the quarterback too i think when when you saw and that you saw different versions of our former quarterback baker mayfield but th th there were times that he was very comfortable in the system i'd probably say like that half season with freddie kitchens when they were just letting it rip he just seemed quick and comfortable and he knew where to go almost like with the rams you get the general idea of how you're going to run it 
you're just like, guys, here's the basic patterns. Here's what we're doing. Let's go. I'm going to find you. We're going to keep going. And you just go fast. You inst you instinctively jump to a read or two and you, you keep it moving to Sean Watson. He he'll pause. He'll pause. Then they will start doing this backyard thing, the Patrick Mahomes thing. And look, it came in handy a couple of times where he was able to dance out of a couple of potential sacks. I, yes, he's elusive. I just worry about my quarterback leaving the ball for too long. And, you know, I, I just, it's, it's the injury. It's the injury factor. I just get it out. Get the ball out. If you got to hold it an extra second because you you need the play to develop and you're going downfield and you got a decent pass protection on that play. Okay. But I, I do see Watson like just not quite there with the timing. His two touchdown passes, yes, he he connected on them. They were wide open. So I mean it, it they weren't incredible plays of precision. He just found the wide open person and got them the ball. That's how you get two touchdowns, no interceptions. That one play where he was going down and he chucked it backward like 20 yards, 10 yards or whatever it was to, I think it was Elijah Moore. That's dangerous. That's, that is, um, th that's decision-making. Not every, please don't try to be a hero on every play. Um, you know, it's the fumbles. It's the interceptions. It, it's the self-inflicted situations. Um, was it Elijah Moore dropped the ball and lost it? Donovan Peoples Jones fumbled the ball and recovered it. And Deshaun Watson fumbled it. I'm checking out the fumbles. Yeah, look, we have to play smart and we got to play damn near perfect. This Browns defense is, it appears to be enough to win a Super Bowl that we're on par with as good a defense as you'll see. Still just a small sample size. But two of those three games were pretty impressive. And we took down Joey Burrow. That wasn't Ryan Tannehill. Yes, he was injured. It's the NFL. Most of the people playing are injured to some degree. How good is this defense? You know, I loved the play. Um... There was the one where Miles Garrett, because he plays basketball and he's kind of like doing a crossover dribble. He's almost playing the, he's changing the defensive line position to almost where he can be the middle linebacker, kind of the orchestra leader of the defensive line. There was a play yesterday where he was on the end of the, of the, the line. And the Titans had two guys, uh, maybe it was a tight end, and I don't know who the other position was or if they went. Two people came over to his side. So then he went to the other side of the defensive line, passed the two tackles. Now he was on the other side. These two, they're mirroring Miles Garrett. They have to play him so aggressively because he's so dominant. By the way, if you're typing comments, I can't see them. I wish I could. I got to find a better way to get the comments coming in because I love your interaction here. Um, that movement on the line delayed the situation long enough to where the Tennessee Titans had to take a delay of game. They could not get the play off in time because they couldn't get set because they were mirroring Miles Garrett. Jim Schwartz has unlocked something fantastic on this team. And, you know, I, I do have a criticism of Coach Stefanski. I'll, I'll call him Coach. He has been who he is since he's joined the Cleveland Browns organization. Was it four years ago now? Um, I don't think he's often referred to as the the the, um, the vocal guy, the charismatic guy, the 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 chest pumping, yelling energy guy. He's just going to kind of give you what he gives you. He brings that even keel, even tempered, 
steady consistency, but man, hang on, let me take this call. Let's see if I can work Justin into the show this way. How are you, Justin? I'm doing good, man. Um, I have you live on Restream here. We're broadcasting on, I don't know, eight different channels at once. Did you have any takeaways from the Browns game? Yeah, I, I tried to type them in there, but you mentioned you couldn't see them, so I thought I'd give this a try. But the thing I was most impressed, I think, from the game was our defense. The pass rush was lethal, but the difference between – Sunday in previous years, the, honestly, the first three games of the season from last year, is we're not just relying on our pass rush. Our secondary looks good. Our defensive back look good. Our safeties look good. It's like a well-balanced attack. Jim Schwartz is doing an amazing job. You know how much of the Achilles heel our secondary has been in the past few years? I mean, do I have to remind us how bad it was? They've been all over the ball, swarming the ball. It's been, it's been a delight to see. A delight to see. And and that's that's the point I was just getting to. You were saying swarming the ball. I was just explaining how Coach Stefanski has a very even keel, straightforward, not a lot of fire and, and, and brimstone coming out of him, not a lot of passion. You see that from the, the Cleveland defense. What I'm not seeing from the Cleveland offense is I'm not seeing their offensive linemen continue the block in extra half second. I'm not see I'm seeing a lot of standing around. They're, they're they're completing a play, but they're not they're not giving their energy, their emotion. Their it, now playing too emotional can get you in trouble. I'm not advocating that, but it just seems like they're swarming with energy on the defensive side, but they're kind of standing around, lacking energy on the offensive side. H have you seen what I've seen there? Definitely a little bit. Yeah, I I would agree with that. You know, Willis is struggling. Um, even even the the the, or the uh, offensive line for the Steelers game, you know, you I like I like Jones. You know, obviously he's got a lot to learn, but just the the attack and the um, the game plan for TJ Watt. You know, they weren't double teaming him, and then you know when they did double team, the other side was wide open on the pass rush for the Steelers. So. I, I would definitely agree with that, Tate. Hey, yes. Sluggish, slow, you know, um, definitely. Yeah, I just... Brian, one thing I liked, one thing I, liked I saw, too, was we got the ball more to the Joku. You know, we worked him more in the offense. I think he's he's a great tight end. We don't give him the ball enough. We don't target him enough. Ma Especially in the goal line. Remember some of those touchdowns last year in the goal line, you know, in the red zone. I mean, he's lethal. I mean, he's he's a, a, an attack, a, a target we need to go to more, in my opinion, third and short, goal line opportunities. Yeah, I mean, look, Elijah Moore had double the, the, the targets yesterday, and, and Joku had four, Elijah Moore had nine, Cooper had eight. So, I mean, that's where the ball is going, and then another four to Peoples-Jones. He's moving it around. He, this is, you know, I, I, I guess... Yeah, there was definitely some of that. It's it's almost like when you kind of realized Tennessee was going to start feeding it to DeAndre Hopkins. You know, that was a result of maybe being down by 13 to three at the half. Um, hey, speaking of the half, how great was that that we were able to get that sack and they weren't they were out of timeouts. So they couldn't even kick that field goal. Like it totally changed the momentum at the end of the first half, too. Getting the other, to me, he's a tone setter. He gets the other guys going as well. Yeah, Garrett, I've we've never seen this version of him unlocked before. How much of this is uh, addition by subtraction, just getting rid of Joe Woods versus Jim Schwartz bringing something special oh. to the table? It, 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 it's night and day. I mean, Joe Woods. Oh, I do not miss hearing that name. 
I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I've seen his name over all these comment threads on the Unhappy Hour and all these brown pages. <laughs> I do not miss him. I miss him like I miss the measles. <laughs> It, it was just a situation where when you'd watch the defense, they under Joe Woods for what was he? How long was he here? Three years? Too long. Too, I, too long. long. Yeah, too long. I, I feel like we could have made the playoffs with competent defense the past two years, even with us being an eight and nine team, really not being unhealthy, being injured. I guess unhealthy and injured are close to the same thing, but they just never seem to really understand the scheme. They just didn't really get the system. So they they were kind of stuck with paralysis through analysis. Now it just seems like th these guys are playing. They look like they're having so much fun. I've never seen a defense like this. Hey, you remember that strong safety that was just terrible? And I'm using polite words here. Was it Sendejo, that strong safety that we had a few years back? But, I mean, yes. Like a, just came off the JV squad for Brunswick High School. <laughs> I mean, you remember him? It was it Andrew Sandejo? Yes, 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 Sandejo. Those, those, those days are long gone. We got Grant Delpe. I mean, these guys these guys are playing. These guys are balling out. Was it six points average per game? The Steelers game that pissed me off the most was our offense gave up more points than our defense, Brian. I know. I know. And. It's it, it's it's absurd what happened, and if we don't harm ourselves, we're a three and O team right now. But look, exactly. I, that's part of the growing process and and the maturity process. I I would like to look at the stat line and and the results of yesterday's game and say, look, Deshaun Watson has turned it around. He's on point, but it's like he also tried to chuck it fifteen yards behind the line of scrimmage. It would have been a backward pat like. He could have easily turned the ball over in a really boneheaded move in a game that was in complete control. But we've seen how many of these games, Justin, over the years, we're in complete control until one turnover turns into seven points and then the, the floodgates open and it's just downhill from there. It almost happened again. Now, maybe I'm being a little too critical, but I mean, you saw that play, right? That was pretty boneheaded. That was not a good decision. But but would you also say this is the best Deshaun Watson has looked? I think one of your posts was, um, you know, that th that we're quick to criticize, but w but where's the love or something like that? Or someone was saying that, and I saw you chime in on it. But I think this was Deshaun Watson's best game as a Brown. I think he has tons of room to keep keep even improving on what we saw yesterday. But this is the best we've seen him in our jersey so far. Yeah, it's it's like you know, an analogy of basketball or even in baseball. You get that butt to get you out of a slump. You hit that first shot or that first free throw as a shooter, you know, to boost that confidence. Hopefully, this is what Deshaun Watson needed to, to gain that confidence, to boost that confidence, where he starts feeling comfortable in the pocket. He starts finding rhythm. He starts finding that um, comfort aspect with his receiving core. You know, and Ford, another comment I put there that you probably couldn't see. Ford is, I mean, he looks good. He has that um, ability to catch the ball out of the backfield that is so coveted with a running back in today's game. I mean, he looks good. And to compliment Hunt, I mean, you hate for Chubb to go down, obviously. But to me, a Ford Hunt backfield is not looking like a bad plan B, in my opinion. Yeah, and they they didn't get a lot of yards on the ground yesterday. I did cover that in the the early part of the show, but but they look like players. You know, that's the same Kareem Hunt you see. He's, he he's gonna give you everything he has on every play. It's gonna be rumbling, bumbling, stumbling. You know, jumping. Oh, oh, how good was it to see Kareem Hunt jump over somebody again? But yeah, the, Ford has hands. He did very well with the Cincinnati Bearcats with Desmond Ritter when he when that whole team was doing something special. Um, he is a player and, and we have, we have uh hunt back there in the mix and, and even Pierre strong, Pierre strong was getting a couple of touches. We remember we traded for him like right, right toward the end of camp. We said, no, we don't need, 
extra depth at, at, at offensive tackle. We need an extra running back. They like that kid too. Yeah, I have to run, Brian, but what happened to Dearness Johnson? He went down to Jacksonville. Um, he may be a free agent right now, actually. I, I never thought he got a fair shake. I thought he was really good running back, you know, and, and we just didn't have room for him, really. De- but, Dearness Johnson was incredible when we needed him to fill in. Remember, he he had that, that big primetime game, right? He broke on the on the on the scene and and crushed it. But um, okay, you got to run. Any final thoughts? Anything you? Any concerns? Any who gets your game ball? Any final thought on your way out the door? You know, concerns would be like most the offensive line. You know, addressing that. Um, you know, I game ball to me would go to Jim Schwartz for. The masterpiece he's done, I know it's small sample size, the first three weeks, getting this defensive going, you know, we're not just relying on our pass rush anymore. We've got guys that are making plays, our, our secondary, Emerson and and Delpit and, uh, and Ward, the Warden, just making plays. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great. Uh, I love our kicking, you know, the position we're in. You know, um, you know he's he played great yesterday. Make made some big kicks. That's always good to have a reliable kicker. Um, and I don't know. I just I like where the direction we're heading. The bounce back to me is what's great. Yes. Losing Chubb, demoralizing loss. You know, could have been a tailspin out of control. But give it to Stefanski. He called a great game. He got them focused in on Tennessee, and we're sitting at top of the of the AFC North, a tough division right now. Yeah, and you're so right about that kicking position, Dustin Cleveland Hopkins Airport is really turned it into something where you can just relax and expect it to go through the uprights. I'm happy with it. And yeah, huge game coming up next week against the Ravens at one o'clock on CBS. Uh, man, that, that that's going to be for control of this division. So let, let's bring our A game next week, man. Thank you for calling in. Appreciate you, Justin. Yeah, so let's feast on that rapper this week. Uh, what's that? Let's feast on that rapper this week. Yes, let's do that. Rat birds for dinner. <laughs> Absolutely. Rat birds for dinner. That was cool. Yeah, I need to find a way to get you guys to call in. Like Sal needs to call in. But yeah, look, I, I'm just super excited about where this team is at. We have seen so much progress out of Deshaun Watson. Thankfully, I, I don't want to be, look, I don't want to be right. Um, I, I was right about everything I had to say. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's that's a pretty ridiculous thing to say, of course. But I believed in this guy. Baker freaking Mayfield. And I still do. I still do. I said we could have won a Super Bowl with him. I, I still believe that. Um, but I don't want Deshaun Watson to suck just because I didn't want us to sell the farm to pay the King's ransom to get a guy who was under, you know, we should have been able to get someone like Deshaun Watson at a bit of a discount, given all of the accusations and the era we live in with the me too, you know, the guilty presumed guilty. Uh, it's, it's not innocent unless proven guilty. It's the opposite these days. I just felt like we paid too much. We didn't need to bail on Baker so soon. Then when Watson came out playing like crap, I, I believe this. If we would have just stuck with Jacoby Brissett last year, we would have made the playoffs. Now, obviously, maybe our ceiling with Jacoby Brissett is going to be lower than it is with Deshaun Watson, which is why you pay the premium. But the game we saw yesterday was what I hope is the, 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 the basement for Deshaun Watson. This is the new standard. Two touchdowns, no interceptions. Somewhere around 300 yards passing. No turnovers. He almost had a third touchdown, but he almost had a turnover. This is what you need to expect at a bare minimum out of Deshaun Watson. But when Deshaun Watson came out the first couple games this year, what was I saying? Uh, I'm ready to see 
uh, our backup quarterback. If if this is what if this is all we're getting out of Deshaun Watson, and we just lost Nick Chubb, and we're seeing that anybody's replaceable, expendable, and at the same time nobody is, put Dorian Thompson Robinson in. Let's see what the kid can do. Maybe he has a better grasp of our playbook. Isn't it possible? It is. He's a UCLA kid. Those are smart kids at UCLA. I used to live out there. I know. But that's what that's what I was starting to say. This defense is elite. It's, it's not good. It's elite. You can say Joe Burrow and the Bengals were banged up, and I could remind you that they went to two straight AFC championship games, right? They went to the Super Bowl. Same receiver, same running back, same quarterback. You know, like, okay, like, well, it was in the rain. Fine, I just hate excuses. The Steelers game was just a bit of a weird anomaly with all the damn turnovers. We did it to ourselves, but the defense isn't the reason we lost that game. Yesterday, you could say, oh, Derrick Henry's getting older, or Ryan Tannehill's not much of a quarterback, or the Titans aren't that good, and their secondary's trash. Okay, okay, excuses, excuses. But did we do what needed to be done? Yes. Did we accomplish the task? Yes. But I was really starting to become concerned that our quarterback, Deshaun Watson, might never get it back. He might never be good again. I didn't believe that i didn't want to believe that i was accurately describing what i was watching in his entire body of work through this season and through last season collectively and i'm giving you my opinion on it that wasn't me projecting ha ah, i i hope that the browns quarterback position is really bad why would i hope for that but if it is i'm gonna call it out you know, I might mention and bring up the fact that, hey, look at the kid down in uh, Tampa Bay. <laughs> Compare the stats side by side. It's not even close. Baker's beating the brakes off of him. But it's a young season. I mean, hey, aren't aren't Baker's boys, aren't they 2-0? I think they're playing huge tests tonight with the Eagles. But I don't know. I like I liked that he gave everything he had when he was in Cleveland. You know, he rubbed some of you guys the wrong way. I don't, I don't get it. All his commercials were too funny. Yeah, they were great, but I'm, I'm still pulling for him in his career. I just sometimes I root for players. Sometimes I root for always Indians, Cavs, Browns, and Buckeyes. Those are the teams. But yeah, especially fantasy football, you draft players. You're in dynasty leagues. You're like, eh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep this guy on my roster forever. I'm gonna, I'm gonna invest in this guy. I'm investing a roster spot, you know, and it's just silly fantasy football, but to me, it's fun. I, I, I enjoy it, but I was not rooting for Watson to be trash. <sighs> we paid him like a top three. He's better. He needs to play like a top five that no top six, seven, eight, nine, ten, top five. He's supposed to be. That's why we went out and did what we did, but my goodness, that defense really, uh, I'm so impressed with our kicking game solidifying still with Donovan people's Jones returning the ball and that muffed punt. I don't like it. I don't think he's the answer back there. He's got a case of the yips or something. Once you get that, you can't unget that. Put somebody back. Somebody's got to be able to do that. Why don't you bring that guy back on your roster? The one that, that caught all the passes uh, in preseason. Who was that wide receiver? Did we sign him on the practice squad? He's the brother of somebody. What was the name of that guy? Let me see where he's at. Let's see if it comes up. A uh, pair of touchdowns. Austin Watkins Jr. Where is he at? Is, did he get claimed three weeks ago? It still says on Wikipedia that he is 25 years old, born in 98. 
This one's from three weeks ago. Just trying to see where he is. Okay, so he did clear waivers, and the team did bring him back as a member of the practice squad. Guys, is it is it okay to maybe ask for Austin Watkins to come back just to catch the punts? To be a, a punt specialist? Is he capable of such things? I don't know. Is it worth a shot? I mean, maybe. Maybe. So that's an area of concern. I'm also curious if we have all this cap room, we have all this extra space. Is there any other offensive lineman that we can sign to kind of reshuffle what we got? Can is Jedrick Wills just a lost cause? Can he can he protect our billion quarter billion dollar player? That's number one. And it's just consistently not seeing it there. That is a dangerous position to have a, 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 a flat tire. So I got some concerns, but hey, game balls for the defense. Game ball to Deshaun Watson. Mari Cooper, give him credit for that second one. Just great performance. We're used to seeing the Browns take a lead. We kind of dominate, but we don't get it done. Like even the Steelers, we had way more yards. It was just the penalties, the turnovers, the pick six, the stupidity of a couple of plays doomed the whole game. So, um, yeah, coming up next, it's going to be the Browns against the Rapids, as Justin said. Um, let's go ahead and look across the league here in the NFL. Of course, of course, four, as it loads. Of course, the Miami Dolphins, they're, 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 they are quite, a difference maker. Tua, Tyreek, man, and Devin. How do you say Arcane? I, I, I always say his, his name wrong. AFC East is the Bills at two and one. Dolphins at three and zero. Oh. AFC North. It's a bit of a bit of a. <laughs> it's weird to see the Bengals zero and two there playing tonight but the Steelers Ravens Browns two and one two and one two and one oh that would have been huge if we could have been three and oh two and one one and two that would have been just a huge shuffler but hey let, let's be grateful that the Colts knocked off the Ravens in overtime Colts are sitting at the top of the AFC South by the way if you're if you're if you're new to the, the program here Jacksonville got upended uh, they're one and two Titans are one and two Houston Texans are one and two, but Hey, CJ Stroud's playing good down there. You know, he's setting records for most yards in three games and no turnovers. And th they think they got a real one there. So I'm pulling for him just like I'm pulling for Justin Fields. I just hate the Ohio state quarterbacks can't play in the NFL crap. It's like, come on, let's, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I think the Bears need to be rebuilt. <laughs> I think there's something wrong on that team. But we'll we'll get to them in a second. Kansas City. Look, they had that that early loss. That's a that's a nice one. They're sitting there two and one. Rest of that division. V Raiders one and two. Chargers one and two. Broncos 0 oh and three. So I mean, even if we just go by wild card right now, the Browns are in a good spot. I still want to win the division. I want home field advantage. Eagles are playing a big one tonight. They're 2 0 in their conference, but they're taking on the division leading Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who are also 2 0. So they're going to clash. I, I hope that's a fun game. I'd love to see Baker win that game. I like Jalen Hurts. I drafted him in a, in a league, and he's, he's a difference maker. Cowboys are sitting at 2 1. Commanders are 2 1. Giants are dinged up and at 1 2. Packers are two and one. Lions are two and one. But the Vikings and the Bears are both 0 and three. Really starting to separate that division. That's, 
Ugh, to start off with an offer. As I mentioned, Tampa Bay is 2 and 0 at the top of their division. The Falcons are 2 and 1, the Saints are 2 and 1, the Panthers are 0 and 3. Niners are 3 and 0. They'll be coming to Cleveland after we get our bye week. So not this weekend, that's the Ravens, not the one after cuz that's a bye. But following that will be the 49ers at home. They are 3 and 0, leading their division. Seahawks are 2 and 1. Rams are 1 and 1. Cardinals are 1 and 2. That's state of the NFL. Man, does Victory Monday feel good or what? I'm such a fan of what's happening right now. So here we are. Go Browns. Thank you for watching. Uh, Strictly Browns here on the Unhappy Hour Sports Show, a support group. So we will come back next week. And uh, yeah, we're going to we're going to put this together as a podcast as well. I just got to kind of set it up, upload the files. Maybe I'll maybe I'll do a data dump and upload a couple of files. I've batched a few of them. It's just extra steps to get everything uploaded. But look, if if we want to do this the right way, these are the things that have to happen until we have the full team in place. So anyway, if you're interested out there, we have these available. These are the Unhappy Hour Sports Show pins. There will only be 100 of these ever given out. And then there are also coasters. Oh, they're not given out. They are a donation. And then these are coasters. They're sets of four. The Unhappy Hour. These are wooden. They are um, laser etched and burned. So some of them are circle and some of them are shaped like the state of Ohio. There's four per set. If you're interested, send me a message. Let me know. I got to dig out my prices and get these all figured out. I really need to just reprioritize doing sports content. I've I've been focused almost solely on trying to figure out what's happening as our world implodes, uh, daily pondering the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, so it's really taken a little bit more of my attention than I prefer. I like to, you know, in theory, we're supposed to have our bread and circus if we're talking about the Roman Empire. Give them bread and circuses. Yeah, sports is just, you know, something we we drink and we gamble and we fill our our heads with insignificant things. Play the fiddle while Rome burns. Um, but I, I like the dichotomy. I don't want to always be doom and gloom and covering world events that are just head shakingly. What? So sports is, as uh, Mike Polk Jr. says in his Factory of Sadness video, and you are supposed to be my pleasant distraction from those things. He says, now, look, I know that sports aren't really that important in the grand scheme of things, but you're supposed to be my pleasant distraction from those things. Um, and no truer words have been spoken, but I really have been prioritizing trying to save our country and save, um, uh, you know, a co- a a a... a a a, a way of life that is quickly uh, slipping through our fingertips. Humanity is on the verge here. And I, I just haven't had the energy to spend too much of my soul of my life on sports, bread and circuses. Now, in the Unhappy Hour Sports Show, a support group on Facebook. It's a private group. Follow us. We, we we talk sports every day. Every day. Every day. And it's not just Indians, Cavs, Browns, Buckeyes. It's all things sports all the time. It's a great group. Almost 2,000 people. Keep it private. It's great. We, we cover every damn thing. It's my favorite group. Find us there. Find us on Twitter. We're at the Unhappy Hour underscore. And I think YouTube.com slash the Unhappy Hour. So we're streaming there, and then I want to also post the videos after the fact. But yeah, link up with us in all the places because we're gonna we're gonna keep talking sports. I I I think it's fun. I think there are a million life lessons that we learn from sports. If you've played, you probably know what I mean. If you've coached, if you've you know, I've done a little bit of. I've tried to do almost everything that I can that seems interesting. Coaching some kids or putting together an intramural basketball team or playing for the varsity team or just walking on to play some tennis and doing pretty well at that. I, I love, I love 
practice, repetition, uh, perfecting a craft and, and just finding ways to level up and improve and the mental part of it and the physicality. It's just, it's, I love it. I love it. You know, a, a, um, a well-lived life, in my opinion, has a, a bit of a wide variety of experiences. And, and I think the sports world, even if we're only living vicariously through the storylines on TV, um, or on our smartphones, rather, it's, there's a lot that we can gleam. You know, sports is supposed to be the meritocracy that America, you know, claims to be, but it's been really a fascist country for a long time, blending government and um, finances, blending government and politics. And in a true capitalistic situation it's just kind of like the better ideas rise to the top and the better products people spend money on and inferior things will dwindle and and leave and just kind of like there's a the invisible hand of capitalism but too many times you're pressing the scales of justice to get things on the wrong perspective um in sports in its purest sense now i don't mean when minka Fitz, fitzpatrick takes a dirty cheap shot hit at Nick Chubb's knee to blow it out. By the way, I did hear good news on Nick Chubb. I heard, and, and this is preliminary, they still haven't done the surgery, but they said, so far it looks like there's only MCL, medial collateral ligament damage, and that the rest of his knee does look good. They don't won't know for certain until they go in and start scoping and doing the operation to, to, to get him back on his feet again. Um, but the early concerns of perhaps that could be the end of Nick Chubb's career, uh, maybe that's not, a, a a strong concern at the moment based on the preliminary good information that we've received. That was a lot of hedging my bets there, but I, I heard a good piece of news. I want to pass it along. Our continued prayers are with him. Um, but yeah, I mean, when, when the referees are right in front of Deshaun Watson's face mask against the Steelers getting spun the whole opposite direction and they don't call that, you know, it kind of seems like the refs are not being, uh, they're not doing their job. They're not living up to their role as a neutral arbiter. It's some of the ticky tack pass interference calls. Those are probably the easiest ways to, you know, push your, your fingers on the scale of justice to tilt the outcome to what Vegas wants you to do, you know, but the the moral of sports is supposed to be that you all get together and you get to compete and the best among you get to compete on an even playing field and let's give it a shot put your best foot forward let's go win the game life is a game it's a video game so play it smart don't don't just just play the game smart don't don't take too many unnecessary risks and like these are life lessons that help kids grow and and figure out how to navigate the world and so there's multiple reasons why I love sports. The strategy, the physicality, the just the greater zeitgeist forming ethos of if you want better results, you need to work harder. You need to work smarter. You need to play better. You need to hold yourself accountable. You need to, that's that. If you want to be better, you got to, you got to, Put more into it. And in general, that's a theory that does span across genres. It doesn't it really need to stay in the sports realm. It is something that really transcends. So anyway, once again, that's why I love sports. So follow the unhappy hour in all the places. This has been a presentation of Strictly Browns on the agree to. Oh, doggone it, on the unhappy hour. Part of the New American Media, T-N-A-M, because the news always matters. The New American Media, because the old American media has failed you. So find us in all of the places, and we'll continue to talk sports as well as our regularly scheduled program, usually Tuesday and Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern time here on the Restream app. We go on to YouTube and to... We don't stream on Rumble. We post on Rumble after. Uh, we go to X. We don't t Truth Social yet. We're on Odyssey. I got to get that going. That's been down a couple of days. Telegram, Instagram, follow us, the, the unhappy hour. All the places. All right.
That's all I got for today's show. I appreciate you. I love you. And we'll talk to you again soon. Take care. Peace.